Programs normally seen at this time will not be presented today in order that we may bring you the following special. It is given to few men in their lifetimes to see this sight. This is the moon moving into perfect alignment between sun and earth. It's the most awe-inspiring sight the heavens can offer, the beginning of a total eclipse of the sun. This is the way today's eclipse looked to people in the remote mountainous state of Oaxaca in Mexico 30 minutes ago. And now the shadow of the moon is sweeping silently across the Gulf of Mexico toward Florida and a rendezvous with waiting millions on the east coast of the United States. The sound you hear, that is the music of the universe played by the sun upon an instrument, the planet Earth. It's geomagnetic music, a computer readout of the sun's magnetic disturbance in the Earth's atmosphere, a fitting accompaniment to the solar eclipse of the century, the Earth in the shadow of the moon. is a CBS News special report, Earth in the Shadow of the Moon, the Solar Eclipse, brought to you by Western Electric, manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell System, as part of their continuing coverage of important news events. The day was bright. The great sun hung motionless in the sky above the Yangtze Valley. The Chinese storytellers record what happened next. The dragon, Lung, restless with hunger, appeared. And before the eyes of the frightened people, Lung began to devour the sun. The day grew darker. The people raised a din of chants and prayers. The dragon was startled. He desisted. The sun slipped from his jaws. And Lung vanished to await another chance. Our computers give us the date. It was October 22nd in the year 2137 B.C. The rarity of what happened on that day and of what is to happen over North America today is explained by the fact that the moon does not orbit the Earth in the same plane that the Earth orbits the sun. If it did, the moon's shadow would pass across the Earth every month. Instead, the moon's orbit is tilted a little bit. So when the high side of the orbit is toward the sun, the moon's shadow passes above the Earth. Later in the year, when the Earth has revolved to a position on the other side of the sun, the low side of the moon's orbit is toward the sun, and the moon's shadow passes below the Earth. But when the Earth is midway between those two positions, the orbit of the moon can bring it into line between the sun and the Earth, and the result is what we're going to see today, the shadow of the moon passing across the Earth. The shadow of the moon has been approaching the Earth for several hours this morning. Right now it is racing toward us in the eastern United States at a speed of about 1,500 miles an hour. The center of the moon is slightly above the center of the Earth, so that's why the shadow is sweeping across the northern part of the globe today. As it happens, the continent of North America is toward the sun, so that's why we'll see the eclipse instead of the Chinese. The moon is climbing in its orbit, so its shadow is climbing toward the northeast across the Earth. It will touch Florida in about 15 minutes now, and then follow up the southeast coast, out to sea north of Virginia, touching land again at Nova Scotia. The path of the total shadow is only about 100 miles wide but a partial eclipse will be visible for about 2,000 miles on each side of the path. But it is the total eclipse that is so phenomenal. The process has already begun in the skies over the United States. The moon is moving slowly between us and the sun. At first, there appears to be just a small bite out of one side of the sun. Then the bite gets larger and larger. The sky begins to dim. You begin to know why this moment was so terrifying to early men. Now the moment approaches when only the blinding crescent edge of the sun is visible. Then the sun shines only between the craters and mountains of the moon. Then the cosmic vision of a lifetime, a total eclipse of the sun. Only the outer atmosphere of the sun is visible now, the incredible corona flashing out into the heavens. Astronomers who have experienced this moment of total eclipse speak of it in awe. 
today, millions of Americans will have a chance to see it for themselves. Then, after three minutes or so, the cosmic sequence reverses itself, the sun flashes back into our sight, the total eclipse is over. Most of us will never see one again. Good day from CBS News in New York. I'm Charles Kiralt, and around here we are frankly excited at the prospect of what is to follow in the next hour. We have cameras all along the path of the total eclipse of the sun. In Mexico, which has already seen the eclipse, we'll be returning there for the reactions of the scientists. We have uh, cameras and correspondence in Valdosta, Georgia, in an aircraft high above the weather over Georgia, in New York and Boston, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and just at this point, I probably ought to say something you've heard before. This broadcast may be the best place to see the eclipse. It will certainly be the safest. Our cameras, which are going to be pointing at the sun, have filters on them that reduce the light of the sun by as much as 10 million times. You can imagine what that kind of light could do to your naked eye or to your eye even protected by smoked glass or dark glasses. It's not much protection. Uh, a, a viewfinder of a camera is the very worst thing. The infrared comes right through and burns your retina without your even knowing it. You might fold uh, several layers of fully exposed black and white negatives, uh, glance at the sun for just a few seconds, but no longer than that. All right, we'll be back to cover this story of night falling across America at midday in a moment. Forget everything you've ever known about size. Forget that an inch exists. We're taking you into a world where a speck of dust is a boulder. And a human hair, a rod. It's a sub-miniature world that we're working in now at Western Electric and Bell Telephone Laboratories. A world of complex electronic circuits. Some so tiny they can pass through the eye of a needle. At Western Electric, where search engineers are finding new ways to make, test, and assemble these circuits. We'll be making them by the millions for new phones and equipment Bell Telephone Companies will use to serve you. This is the kind of thing we do at Western Electric, finding new and better ways to make the things your phone calls are made of. The total eclipse of the sun is now about nine minutes away from the coast of Florida. It's going to follow that path you see, which will permit us to see it in Georgia, if not from the ground at Valdosta, where the clouds are pretty bad, then from an Air Force MKC-135 above the clouds. Then, sort of following Interstate 95, the path of the eclipse will flash across the coastal plain of the Carolinas, out to sea, brush Nantucket Island onto Nova Scotia, where we'll see it again. And when we do see it, what shall we be looking for? Up until now, I have been masquerading as an astronomer, which I am not. This man is. He is Dr. Kenneth Franklin, the assistant chairman of the uh, American Museum Hayden Planetarium in uh, New York. Dr. Franklin, uh, what shall we look for? And all those scientists who have gathered from all over the world, what will they be looking for? Well, you can well imagine that scientists all over the world, especially astronomers, are having a field day today. Yes. Uh, there are those who are interested in timing those special occurrences, which we call contacts, to find out whether or not the moon is on schedule and whether the Earth is turning properly, uh, according to their theories, and if not, to correct these. Uh, others, astrophysicists, are going to be examining the sun itself for some of the rare things that they can see only at the time of a total eclipse, namely the great outer extensions of this tenuous atmosphere called the corona. And then Earth scientists are going to study our atmosphere. The high electrified layers above the Earth, called the ionosphere, will have a drastic shock as that shadow comes along and turns off its source of energy, the sun. Uh, our scientists are going to try and find out what happens to that with rockets running up from Wallops Island. And then there are meteorologists who are going to find out what happens to the local situation as this cooling comes along allows the air to contract and pull in wind from all around that great shadow 100 miles across. You've seen the clips yourself, have you? I have, sir, yes. In human terms, is in, it impressive? In human terms, it is fantastic. You can understand why those people beat on the drums to chase that dragon <laughs> away. Well, 
there are maybe some disappointed humans uh, today. The uh, weather, as we have uh, suggested before, is uh, not ideal along the entire path of the eclipse. We're going to go now to our chief meteorologist, Gordon Barnes, uh, to fill us in on just what people will see and maybe what they won't see. Gordon? Charlie, it's one of those unpredictable situations in the Gulf of Mexico. We have been watching very closely a storm system that has been developing and intensifying down there for the past couple of days. Of course, the pictures that we saw from Mexico were very clear, but on the eastern coast of Mexico and all of Central America, there is quite a bit of cloudiness. The cloudiness has now spread north and into uh, Florida and southern Georgia. In fact, uh, from the vicinity of Venice, Florida, through Sarasota, St. Petersburg, north to the Panhandle region around Perry and Apalachicola, they will have some rather severe thunderstorms this afternoon, accompanied by heavy rain, possibility of some damaging winds, so be on the alert for them. But once you get north of the Georgia-South Carolina border, from there through the Carolinas, Norfolk, Virginia, it's going to be perfect. Skies right now are just clear there. They're going to remain that way. Here in the vicinity of New York City, we have some high, thin clouds around. It remains clear through Nantucket, Boston, Massachusetts, and all the way up to Halifax, Nova Scotia. So all in all, from South Carolina to the north, it'll be clear, and we'll have a good chance to see it. Charlie? In about five minutes, the shadow of the moon touches the coast of the United States. As I've said, we have our correspondents stationed along the path of total darkness, where the moon's shadow will move like a giant crayon mark. We're going to find out what's happening within that corridor now. We're going to start at a place where the eclipse has already been seen, to David Schumacher in Nehapa, state of Oaxaca, Mexico. If you're not fussy about the accommodations, there may be no more fitting place in the world to view an eclipse than here in the remote mountains of southern Mexico. Nearby, the ruins of ancient civilizations, the Zapotecs and the Mixtecs, to whom an eclipse was a frightening occurrence. Some of the few Indians who live here now, being descendants of those people, the government and the church have spent the past week trying to reassure the peasants. Near us, the French site. They have the most elaborate setup near here. And just beyond them, the University of South Florida. And then an amateur astronomer from Los Angeles and his wife who came down in a camper. She's been doing the wash in a stream with the native women. When we first arrived, there were plenty of animals around to test that theory about how they should react to an eclipse. However, they all disappeared, so we had to turn to Hertz rent rooster for our test subject. Uh, he's been named Gordon for some reason, and during the eclipse, Gordon, who had been crowing all morning, suddenly was quiet and just shuffled about rather nervously. This is David Schumacher, CBS News, at Nehapa, Oaxaca, Mexico, now to Nelson Benton in Valdosta, Georgia. The Palm Line campus of Valdosta State College is one of the spots picked by serious observers of the eclipse to study those magic couple of minutes or so when the eclipse is total. And situated on the campus here are some of the 600 or so people who have journeyed here for that uh, particular event. Their equipment is almost as varied as their number. However, it is a little bit like the band showing up for the halftime ceremony and the teams that didn't get here. It is clouded over in Valdosta, and if you look very closely, you may be able to find where the sun is. Nevertheless, the state of Georgia has published warning signs visible to travelers and to residents alike, warning about those dangers of looking directly at the sun. And for the benefit of those who may be in a path that does have the sun showing, Dr. Harry Berline, who is on the faculty here at Valdosta State, can tell us the simplest and safest way of watching the eclipse, Doctor. You take two sheets of white uh, cardboard, you make a small pinhole in the first sheet, hold it at shoulder height, turn your back towards the sun, and project an image of the sun on the second sheet, which serves as a screen. So if you had the sun, you'd get a mini image of I the eclipse. I would get a very mini image indeed. And a safe one but very safe. Thank you very much, Doctor. You're welcome. There are many exotic experiments here and around Valdosta. CBS News also has a rooster in Valdosta. It's a brown, brown seven-year-old rooster that belongs to nine-year-old Barry, uh, Barry Carter. And we're going to see whether he roosts, whether he crows, or whether he flies the coop. As it turns out, with no sun, it may be the only experiment that works. Now, let's go to George Herman, somewhere over the skies of Georgia in an Air Force plane. Thank you, Nelson. We hope this one works, too. This is Air Force 376. It's a C-135. Its main job, ordinarily, is to photograph missile tracks. Today, we've taken out the bank of cameras, and we've put in this giant telescope built by CBS Laboratories. Perhaps you can see in back of me Dr. Bill Glenn, who built it for CBS. 
With this telescope, we hope to be able to see the uh, eclipse of the sun. We've already been able to see a little piece of it, the sun's shadow sweeping across. We're at 40,000 feet here, so we're above about 80% of the atmosphere. We hope to be able to see Haley Steve, the diamond ring effect, if there is one, if the clear air turbulence, which is currently disturbing us, holds off. The signal from here is relayed down to the ground by Caltech Microwave and picked up in Savannah, Georgia, and we hope it works all right. If all goes very well, we'll have one additional effect never seen before, the Earthlit moon. We hope that the moon will show the reflected light of the Earth and we'll be able to pick out some of the craters. Never been done before, but with a special silver, we hope to be able to do it. Continuing our roundup of the CBS correspondent, let's go now to CBS News correspondent Bill Platt in Halifax. Halifax, Nova Scotia is the last major population center along the path of totality. With its magnificent deep water port and magnificent natural harbor, this for years was the principal military bastion of British Canada. And these two are the shores of Acadia, from which Longfellow's French lovers are banished by the British and Evangeline. Kipling, who, as you may recall, had a way with Papa's phrases, called Halifax the Warden of the Honor of the North. The sea favors Halifax's climate, the sun less often so. It is overcast here, something over 60% of the time. The cloud cover this afternoon is high. It is just possible that we may get a break. However, it may turn out to be the most frustrating eclipse watch of all because just to the east of us, perhaps not more than 100 miles, the skies look as though there is a large, clear hole. We have no rooster here in Halifax, but we have some seagulls who are alighting on our vantage point from time to time. We will watch them and report to you. In any case, we're certain to feel the attendant phenomenon, the te temperature drop, and, of course, the the darkening of the sky into twilight here at midday. It is to be an impressive sight, we feel, even without the clear skies. This is Bill Plant in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Now back to Charles Corrault in New York. The small spot of speeding darkness is just now touching the coast of the United States. In about a minute, it will be over Valdosta, Georgia, and in about a minute, we'll go back to Nelson Benton. Just outside Princeton, New Jersey, a new college has opened its doors. It has a campus and dorms, a library and labs, and classes in engineering, business management, labor relations, physics and metallurgy, and lectures in everything from public affairs to law. But if you were to drop in some night, you might find a student doing homework with the aid of a computer. And you'd see it really isn't an ordinary college at all because to go there, you must be a Western Electric engineer or manager. The college is a new corporate education center to increase the talent and skills of the people of Western Electric. Western Electric, we make Bell telephones. We also run our own college to help the Bell system serve you better. The total eclipse is now commencing in Valdosta, Georgia. We hope that all those amateur astronomers and professional astronomers and ordinary people of Valdosta don't have uh, too great a disappointment to swallow. Let's switch back there now immediately to Nelson Benton. Charlie, what we're seeing right now is uh, what you're seeing. There is just nothing here. It has gotten dark, and, uh, and I must say that uh, this is quite an exper experiment, experience because uh, just moments ago, uh, we had reading light. We had uh, enough light to discern figures quite clearly, and it was almost as though a giant uh, rheostat just dimmed the sun. And, of course, we are dealing now with, with no lights whatsoever except uh, some light lights in the uh, in, in the college uh, some uh, 30 or 40 feet from our cameras we are, were all prepared of course to uh, show you totality as it appeared from the ground well this is how it appears because there is about a 12,000 foot uh, rather thick cloud layer between this part of the earth and the moon and the sun and we know where the sun is but uh, we're, and our cameras are looking up at the sun right now, but as you see, there is no image of the sun. Uh, you can see just a faint 
pink light on the base of, base of the clouds. But if I think if I had to pick out the exact position of the sun right now, I would need one of those preset telescopes that uh, these amateurs uh, set up before the eclipse started taking place. Nelson, I never uh, thought I would find a uh, dark screen, uh, an eerie sight, but uh, somehow it is. Well, Charlie, you know, you got to be here to believe it. It's, it's, it's uh, eerie when the, that uh, darkness is four-dimensional. And now, if you will notice, we're, we're hearing applause from the crowd in the background as, uh, as we're finding out that uh, the world is not coming to an end, that the eclipse is ending, and uh, light is very rapidly, just very rapidly, returning uh, to Valdosta in the path of totality. We did not see the sun, but we did see the effect, and believe me, uh, the rock and roll band that was performing uh, some distance away silenced itself, and uh, the lights just went off, and now, just almost like uh, curtain time on Broadway, the house lights are, or rather, uh, at the end of uh, the curtain, at the final curtain, the lights are coming up, and just coming up uh, so rapidly that, that you can indeed uh, uh, observe. Uh, it's just an eerie phenomenon, Charlie. Dr. Franklin, uh, are those scientists down at Valdosta uh, going to be able to learn anything, or is this just a total washout because of the clouds? Well, it's certainly a, not a personal washout. You can just watch that shadow come swooping up out of the southwest and across you there. But the um, people who are contemplating doing radio work can do it, and those who uh, have just ordinary uh, light meters for cameras would be able to record the darkening, the change in light, and uh, enjoy it in that regard. But I think those who expected to go out and look at that beautiful corona are certainly grossly disappointed but uh, we hope that they can make it to another site some other time. Nelson, it looks as though daylight has almost returned to you Yes, now. it has, Charles. I was looking for a photographer with an exposure meter to see if his uh, exposure meter looks like, uh, like, like a thermometer going up. Uh, it's, the daylight is, has returned very rapidly, and we have clear definition, and now we look again to, to see uh, above, somewhere above that dome just where the sun is, and it seems that our cloud cover has gotten even thicker during uh, the period of darkness. And what about the rooster? I thought I heard a, a chicken we, we, We've got to find uh, young Barry, Barry Carter. Barry, <laughs> come over here and uh, what, did, what did, uh, did your brownie rooster do during the eclipse? Did he, uh, did he crow? Did he, did he roost? Or what did he do? Well, he just, there was too much noise going on. He just didn't want to go to the room. There was too much noise. Well, thank you very much, uh, Barry. Well, that's the way it is, Charlie. The best laid plans of uh, the scientists and uh, even us curious just don't work all the time. Brownie stayed awake the whole time. Roosters may uh, go to roost in barnyards, but not when surrounded by hundreds of people. Dr. Franklin, uh, we're going to go very shortly now to that airplane that's racing the moon's shadow. What are we going to see? Uh, I suppose this, this might be the best view of all. Well, I certainly hope it will be the best view of all because there's a very special filter aboard that that will cut down the intense bright corona near the edge of the sun, okay. bring it down to about the level of the corona as it spreads way out away from the sun, so it ought to be just about even illumination. And as they said aboard the plane, there's a hole in that filter which uh, is perfectly clear and should allow us a very great first in science to see the earth shine at the middle. Something nobody's ever seen before. Not seen it before. All right, let's go now to that Air Force NKC-135 at 40,000 feet over Georgia, where pool correspondents George Herman and Jules Bergman will report to us. From the upper right at about 2 o'clock, it's very hard right. for us to pan in on it, but you can see a sort of a hedgerow, a little ripple on the upper right at about 2 o'clock on and, your screen. And that prominence is a burst of hydrogen gas exploding at a temperature of about 2 million degrees Fahrenheit. And beyond that, you can see now, perhaps we can pull back just a little bit. If we can pull back just a little bit with the camera, there you we can go. see the corona stretching out. This is being gathered through the, the telescope that is built here by the CBS laboratories and, and pointed out this window through a mirror. There, we've lost the image from that... Uh, it's rather difficult right. because we have to aim it through a mirror, which is handheld. And the sun is already emerging from behind the limb. I got a view right out of the porthole of our wind plane here, George. The sun's already emerging slightly from behind the moon's limb. Uh, 
totality about to end, and we're going to see all these events in reverse now. Yeah. I couldn't see Bailey Speed take place. The brilliant uh, bursts of uh, sunlight or photosphere light reflected off the valleys of the moon. We may see it now as it happens in reverse. No, I'm afraid not, Jules. What we're getting is an arch of the chromosphere, that uh, pinkish-red glow around right. the photosphere, the brilliant part of the sun. And there's not a chance for Bailey's Beach, the sun shining through the valleys. It's too late for us here. Either it didn't show because of the profile of the moon or because we were unable to get it with our complicated arrangements of mirrors as we flew past. We're and about uh, 41 or 42,000 feet above Savannah here, above most of the Earth's atmosphere, but we still have right. a problem. And it's turning to daylight here. Sunlight's beginning to glint off our wings, to reflect off the clouds. Which are still kind of a mauve or a mouse gray. But and now, in the, Jules, in the extreme distance, you see that black line. That was the Earth's shadow. Do right, I have the right. clouds again for just a second? Let's go back to the clouds. You see there. the black line at the top of the right. gray of the clouds. That is the receding Earth shadow moving off at about 1,900 miles an hour. And that, of course, is the trailing edge of our wing in the left-hand side of the picture. Uh, we can go forward. Maybe we can show part of the wing and the light beginning to come back on it. Yeah. It's moved off very fast. There we shadow. go. That, that, wing, that wing was black and invisible about a minute ago. And uh, it's turning daylight again. Darkness at midday, uh, darkness at noon, as it were, beginning to end. And there is the, the limb of the sun beginning to appear now, more than just the chromosphere. I think that's beginning to be the part of the photosphere. Unhappily, we were unable to see in that brief second with our tele television resolution, we were unable to see the features that the astronomers would have been looking for. Right, but uh, they seem to have had uh, good sunlight without too much clouds in Mexico. Uh, the thousands of experimenters gathered down there may have seen Bailey Beach, may have seen the chromosphere better than we did. What we did have was a spectacular, spectacular corona for this period, right. about two years after the peak of sunspot. Going out, uh, well, maybe a radius, uh, the radius of the moon is about 400,000 miles. We thought about three radiuses at least. Right. So that's uh, over a million, almost a million and a half miles we were able to see the... Uh, it looks like all the astronomy and science textbooks I've ever read and several times better. The pictures were several times better. We hope they were as good down below. And there's uh, more of the sun now emerging from behind the moon's shadow. And, and there you see that the uh, the shadow of the Earth, the umbra, the dark shadow of the Earth, has receded almost entirely beyond our horizon. And we have only the penumbra, sort of dirty gray light on right. the clouds. We Almost uh, like a uh, very early, rather grim looking dog. We might explain again, you're seeing this picture live from an airborne flying observatory, an Air Force KC 135 jet. The Air Force version of the 707 jet through a special telescope rigged up by CBS Laboratories and live pool television cameras. And as, uh, just for the geography, we are approximately over Savannah. Well, uh, I, for one, would like uh, nothing better than to take another look at the best view of the eclipse we've seen so far, and that was really the one from uh, Oaxaca, Mexico. Dr. Franklin and I are going to uh, look at it again and give you a chance to see it again after this message. <laughs> 